Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning, everybody. Hi, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. It's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, we got. We all have our. Run. You know what? I can take it off while I'm in front here. What am I doing? It make, makes it easier for you to understand me because I feel like it's muffled. Of course, now I'm tangled.
would like to uh, give your offering in that way, you can check our church website. There is instructions there on how to give. That's fantastic. So we're going to begin with a word of prayer. We have a song that we're going to be listening to. Again, we're not doing um, we're not doing singing as we singing is considered a high risk activity when when we think of COVID nineteen. Um, for me, it stretches me to recognize that we can worship God in more ways than just the ways that we're used to. And so when we have the music on, I would encourage you to quietly reflect on the words that are being spoken. I often find myself praying as I listen to the music. So uh, you're more than welcome to do that as well. So let's begin our service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we just give you thanks for the day. Thank you so much, God, that we can gather together. And what a day it is, a day to rejoice, a day to celebrate, because it is your day. And we just ask for your blessing upon our service today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to be back. Um, so, there's, first things first, we are going to go over some announcements before I jump into this week's Kids Corner. So, um, announcements for this week include Bible study. So we will be doing Bible study again um, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, over Skype as usual. And then for VBS, just as Chris said, we made it front page. And so that was just super exciting to see the impact and uh, reach that our um, program is making. So we're very proud of that. And that is all due to our fantastic volunteers and all members of the church who have contributed through um, donating snacks or their time or whatever it may have been. So I very much appreciate that. This week for BBS, we are in week six of seven, which seems crazy. It seems crazy in general that the summer is almost over, but it's crazy that our BBS program is almost over. This week, we are doing a very cool activity that I'm excited about, and it is letter writing. So in the kids' packages, spoiler, this week they are going to get a card and envelope in their uh, package. And then they are welcome to write a letter, an encouragement, tell someone who they are. And we will have a mailbox at the church, and all those letters will be delivered to Gray Gables, the nursing home in Markdale. But we're also opening this up to anyone who wants to contribute. So if you are a member of the church, if you are a child in the community, and you want to participate in this activity, the mailbox will be there probably Wednesday um, onwards for probably more than a week, and you're welcome to at any time drop off that letter. Um, don't worry so much about the spread of COVID because those letters will be decontaminated before they make it to the nursing home. They'll be left for a period of time. But you're welcome to just come drop your letter in there and it will make it to a resident at Gray Gables. So I'm really excited about that program and hope it will be a success. And then the last thing for our BBS um, announcements is we ask that you will continue to be partners with us in prayer over our program, that it would encourage the families, that our volunteers would be encouraged, and that they would have the energy and resilience to make it through the end of our program, and that it would just continue to be a good outreach into our community. So that is all of our announcements. And so for Kids Corner, I need a volunteer. Who could be my volunteer? <laughs> Anyone, anyone? Oh, Rowan's gonna be my volunteer. That's awesome. Okay, so Rowan, I need you to pick that up and it needs to be in the air for at least 10 seconds. Oh wait, oh wait, I forgot a major part of this instruction. You need to be in the bucket. And it has to be off the ground for 10 seconds. Oh, I think that was like, Half of a second. Yeah, that's okay. It's impossible, but I'm glad you tried. Thank you. Everyone, round of applause for Brian. Thank you. So, you can take your seat again. That was just to prove that I asked you to do something impossible, and that was to lift yourself up while in a bucket. I remember Pastor Peggy did that when I was probably about Roman's age, and I thought that was so funny because it illustrates the point of this lesson very well. And that is, we cannot save ourselves. So Rowan, when he was in, the, when he was not in the bucket, that was that was fine. But when he had to be in the bucket, when it was about himself, he couldn't lift it up. Maybe he could jump for a second, but he couldn't hold it. And for the same reason, 
we cannot, or similar, we cannot save ourselves because we, we are the problem, we're in the bucket. And so I have on the next slide a really good um, illustration of how this relates to the gospel. So we are on the side where that sin figure is, and on that side, we have sinned. Uh, every time we do something wrong, every time we do something that's not nice, that is called sin, and that's just, we're not perfect. And because we're not perfect, there's this big gaping hole in between us and God. God is on the other side, so it's like there's a cliff. There's a really big cave in the middle, and we can't jump over that. So in this situation, right now how it is, we're in the bucket. We're like Ronan, we can't lift ourselves up. So... The wages of our sin, so the penalty of our sin is death. And we have no hope, we have no happiness, uh, we have no love, we're just over there, and we're stuck. And But with Christ, um, there's the cross in the middle that ties very well for this analogy. And Jesus is the bridge that connects us to God. And we can go through that bridge, we can be connected with God when we believe in him. And that's at the very top of the cross. And then when we are connected with God in union with him, when we believe in who Jesus Christ is, we have a free gift, and that is God, eternal life. And so our memory verse this week, um, it might sound a little different than you're used to it if you have read ESV, NLT, really out of any other translation, because it is from the children's Bible. And it is, I mean that you have been saved by grace because you believe. You did not save yourself. It was a gift from God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. So we are not able to save ourselves from sin. We have done something wrong, and we're not able to undo that. And because we've done something wrong, we can't be with a perfect God, because he is perfect. And sin is kind of like dirt, and you can't have dirt in a really clean room. And so, with Jesus, because of what he did for us, we are able to be with God, because Jesus died for us. And so, we don't have to worry about lifting our own bucket, because Jesus lifted it for us. So, why don't we read this all together, and then this week... I am going to challenge myself, and I'm going to post a video of me memorizing it because I haven't done that lately. And then I challenge you too as well. And if you do, maybe I will bring by an ice cream treat or something like that for you this week. So let's read it together. I mean that you have been saved by grace because you believe. You did not save yourself. It was a gift from God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. And you can feel free to memorize this version or any other version that you may have at home. So that is this week's Kids Corner. I encourage you to, to ponder over that and reflect on that and what that means for you. And um, really put your trust and faith in who God is and what Jesus Christ did for us. And that's all. Thanks, Maddie. That's awesome. Um... So, Pat has asked to share a bit of her testimony today, and so I'm going to invite you to come up. Can I stay here? Uh, no, you need to be here, <laughs> and you need to use this mic. You do, because we need it to be able for people oh, to hear. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. That's okay. Stay away from you. No, you got a mask on. You can come right beside me if you'd like. Yep. So come, on, come right over here, because that's where the camera can see you. Your space. You're not in my space. Okay. Um, I've had a rather strange little time lately. Uh, I've, been, I've been unwell. I had to have um, uh, sorry, cataract surgery on both eyes last a week ago Friday. And um, I was afraid. And I went there, and something had started happening, and I couldn't understand it. The, man, the, the doctor was doing the surgery, and I could feel everything. That had happened one other time with freezing, it didn't take, and I could feel everything that had happened. Um, he kept asking me to look up, look down, and I couldn't follow it. Could not follow what he was saying to me. Didn't have a clue how to respond, how to, how to do anything. He was yelling at me, very angry. He told me that what would happen to me if I didn't. Be still. I couldn't tell him I could feel everything. But anyway, I leave there, I'm feeling weird, but I'm home. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, I couldn't put together two words. I couldn't speak. I forgot everybody and everything. I, I couldn't use my phone to call anybody. I couldn't do anything. 
And um, I was in the hospital, and my, actually what happened is, my husband tried to get me to go to the hospital for two days. He was terrified I had a stroke. And he didn't know what to do. For two days he kept trying, and I refused. So finally he phoned Pastor Chris. And Pastor Chris says, phone the ambulance, don't tell her. <laughs> so that's what he did. Thank God. I was in the hospital there for two days. And I was so scared. And you know what's funny? My girlfriend, who comes with me sometimes, she um, has her little girl, granddaughter, that she brings with her. And at the exact, she, my girlfriend told me, at the exact time that this little girl was praying for me is when things went clear. Mm -hmm. God came to me and he said, why aren't you talking to me? And immediately, I started to pray. And in a second, my mind was clear. I'm not 100%, but it's going to be a while. But with God, anything is possible. Anything. And I'm here today, and I'm talking sentences. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Fantastic. And uh, it was very brave of you, Pat, to, to get up here and share. I know that's a scary thing. So that's fantastic. Well, in the last few weeks, we've uh, taken a couple of breaks in our series of messages on, uh, on the messages in which we've been working through the book of Acts. And last week, we paused as we celebrated Elaine's baptism. And uh, that was exciting. And we also, because Elaine chose uh, to become an official member of the church, we actually took time to just look at the concept of membership from a biblical perspective perspective, to see what church membership really means. So a couple weeks before that, we also um, had celebrated the baptisms of Tammy Dillman. I just realized I still have this on. Of Tammy Dillman and also of Jude Fresnel. And not only did we celebrate that, <coughs> of course I take the mask off and I start coughing. <laughs> anyway, not only did we uh, celebrate that and listen to their awesome testimony, but we turned to the Bible again and we took a closer look at what baptism means. And we've got to do that. And we can't just uh, say, oh, I've heard that once before. I don't need to look at it. We need to be reminded of it as well. And if you missed either of those sermons, either of those messages, I'd actually encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and watch those uh, services because they were they were awesome. They were wonderful. And I'm not saying that because I was I had unbelievable messages. They were just God was present in those services, and uh, they are really important messages to hear. So those were a couple of the big things that happened at our church recently, and I take personal encouragement from that because during COVID-19, it's been really tough, and sometimes it feels like. Um, at least for me, it feels like things are getting bogged down. And I know that's just me because of all the good things that are happening, God is still moving. Amen? Amen. And so even though it might be hard for us, uh, we need to have faith and just trust that God is moving. Hearing things like what Pat shared today just shows that, you know, COVID-19 uh, has made us pause for all sorts of things. COVID-19 has nothing on God. And that is awesome. And so, um, one of the things as uh, we have not been able to do as we've tried to figure out how to do it safely is to celebrate communion. It's been a long time, in fact. We celebrated communion uh, the last, all the way back in March, uh, the Sunday before the Ontario government declared a state of emergency and we were forced to shut the doors of our church. And I've got to tell you that even in this aspect of celebrating communion, inviting people who are watching us on Facebook Live and who are watching on demand, this is really stretching me as a pastor, as a minister. You don't think you're stuck in a, in a, a rut, 
until something like this happens and you realize, um, you, you know, you feel opposition to something, resistance to something, like for this, I would be resisting because I'm thinking, in a couple of weeks we'll be able to do what we've always done. And that's not happening, as I don't know if you've heard on the news, they're thinking we'll be wearing masks for over a year, from, you know, this is going to be the new norm. And so it really stretches my mind on how uh, we can do this, how we can honor God, how we can still uh, celebrate communion. And so this is the first time I've ever led a service in which people online are going to be invited to celebrate communion with us. It's stretching me. It's stretching the, the, my, the way I think of things. And so today, uh, before we celebrate communion, I thought we would hit pause again on the book of Acts and focus on the act of communion. I want to reveal or pull back the curtain of mystery when it comes to communion. There's some things about it that you probably know. There's some things you probably don't know. We're going to talk more about that. So we're going to be reading 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26. It will be on the screen behind me. Before we uh, start reading our scripture, let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we ask for your help. Let your spirit guide us today and open your word to us so that we can better understand not only what we are about to read, but the meaning behind the act of communion. God, we thank you for your many blessings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And with that, my friends, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26, where it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, friends, since the earliest days of the church, Christians have been celebrating communion together. It's actually just one of the two sacraments that Christ uh, initiated. These religious rites that Christ had established for the church. The other if, can you guess? Baptism is right. And so there's only two that Christ told us we needed to do. Interestingly enough, communion goes by other names, and each of these names reflect another aspect surrounding communion. And I would like to share some of those names. And I'm, it's not, I'm not sharing an exhausted list. Believe it or not, there's even more. But these are probably the more uh, well-known names. First, the word communion is a reflection of 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, where it says, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? The act of communion connects us to God and to each other. In a way, it testifies to our faith that we belong to Christ and that we are united in His body. Communion is also known as the Lord's Supper. It's a reference connected to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21, where it says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons, too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. This table that is here, that has the bread and has, has the juice, this table is not my table. This table is not even Dundalk Wesley Church's table. It's Christ's table. Communion is also referred to as the Eucharist, which means give thanks. And it's connected to gratitude we have for all that God has given us. Matthew chapter 26, verses 27, shares part of what Jesus did as he began to celebrate the very first communion. I want you to notice what Jesus does after he picks up the cup. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. 
Now the beginnings of communion, which takes place at the Last Supper, starts with the Passover feast. The Passover feast was and is the most sacred feast of the Jewish religious year. It commemorates the final plague of Egypt when the firstborn of the Egyptians died and the Israelites were spared because of the blood of the lamb that was sprinkled on their doorposts. The lamb was then roasted and eaten with unleavened bread. And God commanded, and God's command was that throughout the generations to come, the feast would be celebrated. The count of Passover can, is recorded in Exodus 12, if you'd like to do a little bit of further digging. During the Last Supper, a Passover celebration, Jesus took a loaf of bread and he gave thanks to God as he broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. He concluded the feast by singing a hymn and then they went out into the night to the Mount of Olives. It was there that, as predicted, Jesus was betrayed by Judas. And the following day, Jesus was crucified. By dying on the cross, Christ was thus sacrificing his own blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus is our sacrificial man. Now you might think, and since the church has been celebrating communion for almost 2,000 years, that we completely understand every aspect that takes place surrounding communion. And that Christians would be in total agreement about it. But the truth is, communion is a mystery. I really thought about putting my title, my message here, up on, on, on the screen because I have communion, pulling back the curtain of mystery, and in brackets, just a little bit. It's, it's amazing. It is still a mystery. Yes, there's lots about communion that we do know. And even a person who is not a believer, who came to church and watched us, would be able to tell you aspects of communion. Oh, yes, it involves this bread and this juice, and they take, take time to read scripture, and they pray, and yeah, it looks simple enough. But there's so much more to it. Some Christians, and so I'm going to share some, some thoughts about this, some ideas, and I, I want you to know that um, you know, I believe in good conscience and I am doing what I, what I feel I'm supposed to be doing and I, I think I got the right track but I, I don't argue with others who disagree with me when it comes to communion. There are differences of opinion. And in our day and age when everyone thinks if you don't agree with me then I have to hate you and argue with you and you're totally evil. I think the fact that we can gather together around Christ's table and celebrate communion together, even if we don't all agree 100% with exactly what it all means, says something about us as a church. So communion. Some Christians believe that the bread and the juice that we see before us when we celebrate communion literally transform into the physical flesh and blood of Christ. They recognize in their belief that the bread still tastes like bread and the juice still tastes like uh, juice. And you know, in other churches, by the way, uh, drink, use wine, right? And that's, that's a whole new other issue. And you notice I'll keep referring to it as juice, but at churches celebrate it with juice or wine. But there are some that believe that these elements, as they are theologically referred to, elements meaning the bread and the juice or wine, that they literally turn into the flesh and blood of Christ. That they still taste the same as bread and juice, but they are somehow transformed. On the other hand, there are Christians who believe we simply celebrate communion as an act of remembrance. They see the ordinance as symbolic, is a reenactment of the gospel message. Yet there's also another way, a third way of looking at it. 
And I have to say, this is the Wesleyan denomination's way of thinking of it. And I like it. Even if I wasn't a Wesleyan, this is where I would be on that spectrum where everyone falls. And that is, a the and I'm going to give you the theological uh, term, is called consubstantiation. And what it means is that the bread is bread, the juice is juice. But somehow, I love that part, somehow God is involved in all this. In the act of celebrating communion, God is there. And personally, I think every time I have had communion, I have experienced God in that moment. Am I the only one who feels that way? Good, I got a couple of heads and going, no, no, they agree with me. And so it can't, in my opinion, it can't just be a simple act of remembrance. God is involved. But I like it, because we just say, we don't know how. <laughs> and I love that. We're okay with mystery. We're okay with the fact that God is so big, we can't fully comprehend all that he does. And that's all right. So who can celebrate communion? And that's another interesting question that has a whole the, you know, huge spectrum of, of beliefs. There are churches that say, unless you're a member of our church, you can't have communion. You know, there's others who say, unless you're baptized, you can't have communion. There's all sorts of beliefs with that. It's interesting uh, when we look at communion in the Bible, the, in the gospel, the gospels, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all record how uh, communion was celebrated. But there's a, a little bit more to it as well. And this is the Apostle Paul talked about communion in 1 Corinthians. It's in chapter 11, if you're wanting to dig a little further. And this is probably one of the only stipulations when it comes to communion. You know, Paul includes a statement not found in any of the Gospels. He says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So, who can have communion? Well, it... If there's any exclusion, it would only be excluding those who do not take communion seriously. We may ask what it means to partake in the bread and the cup in an unworthy manner. It may mean to disregard the true meaning of the bread and cup and to forget the tremendous price our Savior paid for our salvation. Or it may mean to allow the ceremony to become a dead and formal ritual. Communion wasn't instituted by Jesus so that we just mechanically do it. In keeping with Paul's instructions, we should uh, examine ourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup. And if you sit there and examine yourself and you say, I'm unworthy to do so, congratulations. You are actually in the right spot. You, do, you can partake in communion. Because none of us are worthy. But in saying that, we must be careful not to put barriers around the act of communion where there shouldn't be. All are welcome to celebrate communion, to partake in the act and to connect with Christ and to receive the grace that Christ offers all. And this leads to the final thing I want to touch on when it comes to communion and it is something that I've already brushed up against, but haven't uh, formalized by giving it a name. Communion is a means of grace. That's a theological term. It's a means of grace. I used to get hung up on that thing. What? You take communion? That means you can force God to give you grace? You can manhandle him and say, hey, I'm eating your bread and, and I'm having the juice, so you got to pour your grace on me. What I love is when I got asked by one child, if I eat more bread and more juice, do I get more grace? Now, wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> You'd see me with piles of breadcrumbs around me and my lips stained with juice because I'd be chugging it back and trying to get more grace. No, that's not what that means. 
Communion is a powerful act. As I shared in the act of communion, Christ is present. God's with us in the act of communion. When we celebrate communion, when we eat of the bread and drink of the juice, one can feel the presence of God. That's grace. It's an act in which God's grace is conveyed to us. Now, if, I, if it sounds like I don't entirely know what I'm talking about when it comes to communion, I'm going to tell you, you're right. I don't know everything about communion. I take encouragement from what Paul shared with the church in Corinth when he said, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when, uh, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part that I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. We don't have to know everything when it comes to communion. It is an act in which we are blessed to participate. We are all welcome to be encouraged to celebrate communion as often as you can. If COVID-19 has taught me anything, it's just to value those things that I already thought were important, value them even more. I never thought that I would go five months without celebrating communion. And here we are. It's fantastic that we can be here and to do that. It's fantastic that we are able to open the table even broader to those who, for what reasons we don't know, cannot be with us today. Maybe they are immunocompromised. Maybe they have other health issues. I regret the fact that we didn't have this technology earlier, that there were people who were part of our church who were not able to celebrate communion with us because they were not physically present here. I'm glad that God is expanding my mind. I have a song that I'd like Maddie to play. Just, I thought it would be nice if we took some quiet time just to pray to God before we actually celebrate communion. And as we do that, if you would like to prepare the first part of your communion by peeling that very first clear piece of plastic off of your cup, that would be wonderful. Everyone got their bread and didn't spill their everything. Awesome. I'm telling you, the first time I tried it, <laughs> everything almost went flying. There you go, you're better than me. I thought I'd begin by uh, reading our scripture once more from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, you who are walking in fellowship with God and are in love and in harmony with each other, and you who do truly and earnestly repent of your sin and intend to live a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from this time in His holy ways, draw near to Him and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and meekly make your humble confessions to Almighty God. Let us pray. O oh God of grace and mercy, we thank you that you ever loved us and provided for our, our redemption. We thank you for your Son who died to save us and for your Spirit who invites us to draw near. Guide us now as we commemorate the suffering of our Lord. 
Help us to remember the cost of our salvation. Help us to commune with you and with each other. And so consecrate the bread and wine, which are here prepared, that as we partake of them, we may receive the spiritual benefits of Christ's broken body and shed blood. In his name we pray. Amen. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Take and eat this, remembering that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith. Thanksgiving. I right, ask that you open your little cups. They can be very tight and hard to open, so I'll give you a moment. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Drink this, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you. And be thankful. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you. Always. Amen. We have one final song to conclude our service with. Well, friends, that concludes our service for today. I want to say thank you for joining us. It's wonderful to be able to celebrate communion with each of you.